Welcome back to Hardware Unboxed. Today, we're taking a look at what is, in my opinion, one of the most exciting CPUs to be released in the last few years, and that is the Core i5-12400. There's actually nothing that amazing about this CPU on paper. It's a heavily cut down version of the 12600K, which we have already looked at. The four E cores, they're gone. The L3 cache has been reduced from 20 megabytes to 18. The turbo clock speed has been wound down by 10% and the base power has been slashed from 125 watts to just 65 watts. So when compared to the 12600K, the 12400 isn't nearly as appealing on paper, but what makes the 12400 so exciting, for me at least, is the price. Whereas you can expect to pay around $300 US for the 12600K, which is the same price you'll pay for AMD's Ryzen 5 5600X, the 12400 is just $210 US, with the FSKU coming in at just $180 US. So 40% less than the 5600X and 25% less than the rather unappealing 5600G. In most instances, particularly gaming, the 12400 shouldn't be a great deal slower than the 12600K, and if that is the case, it's going to be an extremely sought after item for budget gamers. What you're getting for around $200 US is a 6P core 12 thread Elder Lake CPU that operates at 4.4 gigahertz with an 18 megabyte L3 cache and UHD 730 graphics. So it should be even faster than the last generation's Core i5 11600K, which initially came in at $270 US early last year. Now, before we jump into the benchmarks, let's go over the test system specs. For this one, I haven't done any DDR5 testing. It does seem like a waste of time right now. And we also know all we need to know in terms of DDR4 versus DDR5 performance. You can either refer to our Core i9-12900K review or my dedicated DDR4 versus DDR5 content covering 41 games. So for testing the Core i5-12400, I'm using the MSI B660M Mortar Wi-Fi DDR4 with 32GB of dual rank, dual channel DDR4 3200CL14 memory, and that is the same stuff I use for all of our DDR4 testing, and it's typically faster than single rank DDR4 3800CL18 memory in terms of performance. The K-SKU Outer Lake CPUs have been tested on the MSI Z690 Tomahawk Wi-Fi DDR4 using the same memory, and all boards were updated with the latest BIOS revision. I've also updated my Ryzen data using the MSI X570S Tomahawk Wi-Fi motherboard. Now, all gaming data has been updated for the AM4 and LJ1700 CPUs with a resizable bar enabled. The plan was to do the same with the Intel 10th and 11th Gen Core processors, but performance actually went backwards in all instances with rebar enabled. So for now, I've left that PCI Express feature disabled on those older platforms. Finally, the last test system notes worth mentioning are the fact that all application and gaming data has been collected with the AMD Radeon RX 600 XD graphics card installed, and the operating system of choice was Windows 11. Okay, I think that covers everything test system related. Let's dive into the results. Starting with the Cinebench R23 multi-core results, we find that the 12400 is good for just over 12,000 points, and when following the 65 watt spec was just 3% slower. That being the case, it's incredible to see that the base spec 12400 beats the 11600K by an 8% margin and the 10600K by a massive 32% margin. But perhaps most impressive of all is the 9% margin it defeated the 5600X by, which doesn't bode particularly well for AMD. Then finally, when compared to the 12600K, the 12400 was 30% slower, and this is in part due to the 10% reduction in frequency, along with the removal of the 4E cores, and then a 10% reduction in L3 cache capacity. The single core performance was also very mighty, and this of course explains how the 12400 beat the 5600X. Here we're looking at a 12% improvement in performance. Moving on to the 7-zip file manager test, the 12400 is less impressive here, though it does manage to slightly edge out the 11600K, so that in itself is a pretty good result. Still, when compared to the 5600X, it was 12% slower and 13% slower than the 12600K, though given the difference in price, that is again a very good result for the locked Core i5 part. Unfortunately though, it doesn't fare nearly as well for the decompression test, as here the 12400 was only able to edge out the 10600K, making it slower than the 11600K by a 12% margin, almost 30% slower than the 5600X. The Corona benchmark sees the 12400 delivering exceptional levels of performance, beating the 11600K and 5600X, taking 117 seconds to complete the workload, meant it was 9% faster than the 5600X, despite being 26% slower than the 12600K. 
Here we see that the Core i5-12400 was good for a score of 667 points when running without power limits in the Adobe Premiere Pro benchmark, and that meant it was able to match the 8-core 16-thread 10700K while beating the 5600X by an 8% margin. Then when power limited to the 65W spec, it basically matched the Ryzen 5 5600X, and that made it 8% slower than the Unleashed configuration. Photoshop isn't a core heavy application, so both 12400 configurations delivered virtually the same result, and that meant no matter which way you slice it, the locked Core i5 is as powerful as the Ryzen 5 5600X in this workload. The 12600K on the other hand, that's clocked 11% higher and consequently was 11% faster in this test. The last Adobe application we're going to look at is After Effects, and here the 12400 was only 2% faster with the power limits removed. That made it 7% faster than the 5600X, and 6% faster than the previous generation 11600K. Once again, I'm going to include Factorio in the application benchmarks, as we're not measuring FPS, but rather updates per second. This automated benchmark calculates the time it takes to run 1000 updates, and this is a single thread test, which apparently relies heavily on cache performance. Basically, it only uses a single core heavily, so the power configuration doesn't matter, allowing the 12400 to produce a score of 202 points, even when adhering to the 65 watt spec. And that's the same score you'll receive from a Zen 3 processor, and only 2.5% less than the 12600K. Now, when it comes to code compilation performance, the 12400 is a bit of a beast, completing our test in 6,070 seconds, making it 24% faster than the 5600X, and 13% faster than the 11600K. In fact, it was only 8% slower than the 5800X, though it was 21% slower than the 12600K, which of course has E cores, a larger L3 cache, and is clocked higher. The last application benchmark that we're going to look at is Blender, and here the 12400F was just able to edge out the 5600X while matching the 11600K, so as good as it currently gets for a 6-core 12-thread processor in this application. The big improvement though when compared to the previous 11th generation is power consumption. For the same level of performance, the 12400 reduced total system consumption by 28%, and again, that is total system power consumption, not just CPU power. So the savings are truly massive, and it places Elder Lake roughly on par with Zen 3 for this comparison. Now time for some gaming benchmarks, and we'll start with F1 2021 using the second highest quality preset at 1080p, with of course the 6900 XT. Here the 12400 matched the 11600K and 10700K, making it just 9% slower than the 12600K and 15% slower than the 5600X. That might seem a little bit disappointing at first, but remember, the 12400 costs around 30% less than the 5600X, so overall a great result in terms of value. Next up we have Rainbow Six Siege, and here the 12400 was slightly faster than the 11700K, 10700K and 3700X, making it just 8% slower than the 12600K. That does, however, again make it quite a bit slower than the 5600X, 17% slower in this example, or 19% slower if we compare the 1% low figures. Still, overall we're seeing strong performance from the 12400, and an excellent result in terms of cost per frame. The Watch Dogs Legion data is much more competitive, at least in relation to the more expensive 5600X. Here the 12400 was just 2.5% slower, so basically the same level of performance can be seen, and the same is really also true in comparing it with the 12600K and 11700K, so a strong result for the locked Core i5 processor in this game. Here we see that for the first time the 12400 is able to overtake the 5600X, seen in Shadow of the Tomb Raider, and while the average frame rate is very similar, the Core i5 processor was 9% fast when comparing the 1% low data. It was also just 4% slower than the 12600K, and a massive 26% faster than the previous generation 11600K. And it's also worth noting that once again running at the 65W spec had little influence on performance. Intel has a serious performance advantage in the Rift Breaker, and here the 12400 easily beats the 5600X, offering up to 26% greater performance, seen when looking at the 1% lows. It was also just a few frames slower than the 12600K, and 13% faster than the 11600K. Interestingly, the 12400 was a lot slower than the 12600K in our Hitman 3 benchmark, trailing by an 18% margin. Now, the locked Core i5 part is clocked 10% lower, and packs 10% less L3 cache, 
So it is possible under certain conditions to be around 18% slower. So not a great result here relative to other parts like the 12600K and 5600X, despite the performance overall being very good. Age of Empires 4 is another game where the 12400 trails the 12600K by a fairly significant margin. 12% for the average frame rate and 22% for the 1% lows. And that also meant that it was up to 16% slower than the Ryzen 5 5600X. Still, when compared to past generations, it did roughly match the 11700K and was quite a bit faster than the 11600K. So in that sense, performance was very good. The 12400 performs much better in Far Cry 6, at least when compared to the 5600X, as it was up to 10% faster, beating even the 5800X and 11700K. It was, however, up to 15% slower than the 12600K, seeing we're looking at the 1% lows, still overall a good result here for Intel's new base model Core i5 processor. The Horizon Zero Dawn results aren't that favourable for the 12400. That said, it is worth mentioning that if we were to use the ultimate quality setting, the game is entirely GPU limited here, and it does equalise CPU performance, seeing the 5600X and 12400 matched, even with the 6900XT at 1080p. But with the dialed down favour quality visual preset, the game becomes more CPU limited in our test conditions, and this saw the 5600X up to 21% faster, with the 12600K up to 17% faster. Last up, we have the Cyberpunk 2077 results, and this game is mostly GPU bound, even with the slightly dialed down quality settings that we're using here. The 12400 was able to nudge just a few frames ahead of the 5600X while trailing the 12600K by just a 4% margin. Again, we are quite heavily GPU limited here, but that's also going to be the case for most games, especially given you'll likely be using a slower GPU at a higher resolution. When it comes to power consumption, the 12400 is very economical, using around 20 watts less than the 5600X for the same level of performance. It also reduced total system usage in this example by 8% when compared to the previous generation Core i5-11600K, so overall power consumption isn't an issue when gaming. Now here's a look at the 10 game average, and as you can see the Core i5-12400 without any power limits and an all-in-one liquid cooler isn't much faster than the 65 watt spec using the box cooler. We're talking about less than a 2% difference on average. When compared to the 5600X, the 12400 was on average just 6% slower and 8% slower than the 12600K. So given the cost savings on offer here, that does make the 12400 an exceptionally good deal for gamers. Okay, so here's how the included RM1 box cooler handles the Core i5-12400 when running at the 65 watt spec. So that's not locked at 65 watts, that's just running at the 65 watt spec. And this means for a brief period, the CPU will run at the PL2 mode, which sees package power hit 75 watts, and here CPU temps peaked at 80 degrees. But for the majority of this test, package power was limited to 65 watts, where the RM1 cooler was able to keep the CPU at just 75 degrees. So this little cooler works well enough at the 65 watt spec. And we see that during the Cinebench R23 stress test, the all-core frequency when in the PL1 mode hovered between 3.7 and 3.8 gigahertz. Now, if we remove the power limits with the RM1 box cooler still in place, the 12400 maintains an all-core frequency of 4 gigahertz, so a 5 to 8 percent frequency boost there, and that saw temperatures peak at 82 degrees. But the RM1 was noticeably loud now, so not an ideal solution, despite the fact that it does work. Replacing the RM1 with the Corsair IQ H100i Elite Capelix dropped the all-core 4 gigahertz operating temperature to just 54 degrees for the peak, though the temperatures were regularly below 50 degrees. So this really is an overkill solution for such a CPU. A basic $20 tower style cooler will work just fine, but since I had the H100i already installed in the test system, I just went with that. Okay, so that's how the Core i5-12400 performs, and ideally I would have liked to have included a few extra CPUs such as the Core i5-10400, the 11400, and the Ryzen 5 5600G. But due to, let's say, time constraints, I wasn't initially able to update all of that data because I did have, or at least I thought I had to switch gears to uh, a new upcoming GPU. But things went sideways there, and you will hear more about that on the main channel very shortly. Quite frustrating, but it is what it is. So anyway, after having put this video on pause to go switch gears to look at a different video, I ended up coming back to this one because we had, um, yeah, because of the delays. Anyway, the good news is I did have time because of that to do some additional testing, but rather than 
go back and redo large portions of this video. I'm just going to show you a graph that summarizes that data. The 12400 was 17% faster than the 5600G on average, and 14% faster than the 11400F. And it's interesting to note that while the 11600K was just 4% faster than the 11400 on average, the 12600K is 9% faster than the 12400. But it is worth noting that while the 11400 and 11600K feature the same clock frequency discrepancy as the 12th gen parts, they actually have the same 12 megabyte L3 cache capacity and we know many games are sensitive to cache capacity. So this is likely why we're seeing a larger margin with the 12th gen parts. Then we're comparing the AMD and Intel CPUs in the gaming benchmarks. It's really going to come down to the games used and of course how those games are tested. In our relatively small sample of games, the 5600X enjoyed big wins in Horizon Zero Dawn, Hitman 3, Rainbow Six Siege, Age of Empires 4, and a solid win in F1 2021. Meanwhile, the 12400 was strong in Far Cry 6 and The Rift Breaker. Of course, it also depends on how you test these games. Horizon Zero Dawn, for example, using the ultimate quality settings, sees the game become entirely GPU limited, and this equalizes CPU performance, seeing the 5600X and 12400 matched, even with the 6900XT at 1080p. Now, in this market segment, I personally favor value, and that's because if you're more performance oriented, you'd just go with a more expensive CPU, such as the Core i7-12700K or Ryzen 5 5800X. But when it comes to value, I feel Intel easily has AMD beat right now. The 12400F is already on sale for $180 US, and although B660 motherboard options are quite limited at the moment, we are expecting to see some pretty great quality boards become available at around $160 US. Meanwhile, good quality AMD B550 boards start at around $140 US, so there is a cost saving there, but even so, the 5600X on a good budget B550 board will set you back around $430 US, while the 12400F on a decent B660 is expected to cost around $340. So that's a massive saving for what will amount to similar gaming performance. But if you want to go ultra budget from AMD while sticking with six cores, you can snag the MSI B550MA Pro for $95 and pair that with the 5600G for $240, totaling $335, which is basically what you're paying for the much faster and better quality 12400 combo. Of course, there will be even cheaper and nastier B660 motherboards to pick from, so it is possible to cut costs further with Elder Lake, meaning Intel wins the budget battle no matter which way you slice it. The Core i5-12400F, just pretend there's an F there, same CPU, just without integrated graphics, and it's a bit cheaper, but yeah, that, the 12400F is going to be my new go-to budget CPU, particularly for gaming, and I really do hope to see some nice budget B660 motherboards available soon. And that is going to do it for this review. If you enjoyed it, then please do hit the like button, subscribe for more content. There may be a few more locked processes we can check out. And if you'd like to join us over at Floatplane or Patreon, that is very much appreciated. Uh, the support we get from viewers there helps us purchase CPUs like this. This was not provided by Intel. I bought this locally. So yeah, good stuff there. You will get access to our exclusive Discord server, a monthly live stream that Tim and I do. We answer your questions there live. Behind the scenes content, Q and A's, a lot of cool stuff there. So if you're interested, check out Floatplane or Patreon. If not though, perfectly fine. And I would like to just thank you for watching this video. I'm your host, Steve, and I'll see you again next time.